And thanks be to Dave. It's off. Right. And now it's on. I don't know about you, but uh, this has been a great few days if you're a Warriors fan. Yeah. Four straight sweep. I was going to bring a broom up here. Sweeped. If you're a Cavs fan, I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Three championships in four years. That's really great. And so, kind of to honor that, I wanted to start off with a basketball story. It's about Michael Jordan. If you've heard of Michael Jordan, he's probably the greatest professional basketball player of all time. There was a night that he scored 69 points in a single game. Just so happened in that same game, there was a rookie named Stacy King. He made kind of an inauspicious debut. He shot just one three free throw during the game, but he made it. After the final buzzer, a reporter asked King for his thoughts on the game, and Stacy King replied, well, you know, I'm always going to remember this night as the night that Michael Jordan and I scored 70 points. <laughs> well, I guess that's one way to look at it. Michael Jordan was a great, great basketball player. And yet John Elliott, in his book entitled Overachievement, claims that Michael Jordan was not a really gifted basketball player. Now, I'm not sure I'd agree with that, but he, 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 he points out that uh, Michael Jordan was uh, dropped from his uh, junior high school basketball team. I didn't know that. He only averaged 17 points a game in his college career. Wasn't a very good rebounder. He, at the end of his career at least, he never ranked first in any all-time major NBA statistic. Still, by most, he is considered the GOAT. Anybody know what the GOAT is? Greatest. The greatest of all time. Now, you may have a little debate from LeBron James fans. Might even have some debate from Kevin Durant fans or Steph Curry fans. But most would consider Jordan the greatest. He's a five-time NBA MVP. And how did this happen? Was it passion, confidence, determination? I'm sure those were all involved. But according to John Elliott, he was simply the best that ever, be, that ever was because that's what he set out to be. There's a part of almost everyone that is thrilled when someone attempts to reach lofty goals. The pioneer, the successful entrepreneur, the victorious athlete, all st speak to us about the, the ability of the human spirit to reach monumental accomplishments when properly motivated. Vicariously, we too share in their achievements and hope, well, find hope for our own lives, don't we, in their successes. President John F. Kennedy, his hero was his grandfather. And he loved to hear stories about his grandfather's boyhood in Ireland. One of these stories concerned how Grandfather Fitzgerald used to walk home from school after school each day with a group of friends. Sometimes these boys would challenge each other to climb over the stone walls along the lanes of the countryside they walked on. Kennedy says, however, there were times when Fitzgerald and the other, other boys were sometimes hesitant to dare the hazardous climbs it took to get over the wall. So they devised a way to motivate themselves to take the risk involved. They would toss their hats over the wall. See, they knew that they dare not go home without their hat. Because if they did, they'd get in trouble, so... They had to climb over the walls to get them. They tossed their, their hats over the wall as a way of motivating themselves to take the risk. There are times when all of us long to toss our hats over the wall. There are times when we hunger 
in our own way for the heroic, whether it be to change jobs, to own our own business, to go back to school, to retire, whatever. There come those times in life when we feel the need to make a change. I know of one man in particular who decided to make such a change. He was 30 years old at the time. He owned a successful small business which had been left to him by his father. He was secure, well-liked, respected by his friends and neighbors, and by all accounts he was meeting his responsibilities. But he knew that wasn't where he belonged. He felt called to a, to a ministry, a ministry of teaching and, and preaching and healing. So he threw his hat over the wall. At first, he met with spectacular success. His reputation spread with amazing speed. But as his popularity increased, so did his number of critics, especially in his hometown. Some of his closest friends tried to dissuade him from what they considered his insanity. His family was concerned about him. But he persevered in his new calling for three years, only to die an untimely death. No reasonable person would have judged his life a success, <coughs> but it was. It was the most successful life ever lived, for all of this took place around Nazareth more than 2,000 years ago. If anyone could claim to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time, Jesus certainly could. Jesus tossed his hat over the wall, and you and I can be thankful that he did. And he modeled for us what the life of adventure should truly be. Early in the 20th century, Charles Lindbergh flew his little spruce wood plane across the Atlantic. And as he was leaving the last stretches of land in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland, he kept looking down on the forest and lakes and trees and thinking, man, if there was an emergency and I had to land this plane, why, well, I, I might do it in this little clearing over here. Or as I go over these trees, I might be able to land in this spot of land over here. <coughs> but soon as he left the coastline and went into the Atlantic, he knew that he had to throw his hat over the wall. Does it make your blood roll, roll, run faster to know that there are people who have charted a heroic course for their lives and then seen it through? There are times in everybody's life where they need to take that hat and throw it over the wall, isn't there? Now, of course, nobody accomplishes anything of note without critics. Toss your hat over the wall and you learn very quickly who your true friends are. I love this story about Winston Churchill, truly a man of heroic stature, who was one of the most criticized politicians who ever lived until today. But he knew how to handle his detractors. Perhaps the most famous of Churchill's exchanges was one he had with us at a state dinner with Nancy Astor whose own reputation of asset wit and instant repartee was considerable. Well, during the dinner, Lady Astor was compelled to listen to Churchill expound on his views on a great number of subjects, all of which were at odds with what she believed. Finally, no longer able to hold her tongue, she spat out, Winston, if you were my husband, I would flavor your coffee with poison. <laughs> well, to which Churchill immediately responded, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jesus had his critics too. In today's lessons from the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is still in the early part of his ministry. We're only in chapter 3. However, people are starting to take note of him. He's chosen his 12 disciples who will carry on his work after he is gone, and the crowds are growing larger. Momentum is building towards an amazing ministry. But almost immediately, he runs into opposition. First of all, it's from his own family. 
Mark tells us that when Jesus' family heard about what was happening, they, they went to take charge of him. They, they, they had heard he's out of his mind. And they wanted to reel him in. Can you imagine that? Jesus' own family wanted to shut down his ministry and have him come home. But isn't that the way life is? Sometimes it's the closest to us who have the hardest time coming to grips with our dreams and aspirations. Could even come from our colleagues. In Jesus' case, it was the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, who had come down from Jerusalem. And with a poisonous sneer, they greeted his teachings like this. He's possessed. He's possessed by Beelzebub, ruler of demons. He casts out demons. Isn't that the way of it, though, when you really think about it? You start to make waves, and somebody's going to try to wrest those oars out of your hands by belittling the work you're doing. One author calls this the Salk theory. Jonas Salk, the great doctor of medicine who pioneered polio research and discovered the polio vaccine, had a legion of critics he dealt with over the years. At one point, he made an interesting observation about the nature of criticism, which seems to hold true for any person who is successfully innovative. He said, first, people will tell you that you're wrong. Then they'll tell you you're right, but what you're doing isn't really important. And then finally, they'll admit that you're right and what you're doing is important, but after all, they knew it all the time. We all have our critics. Maybe the best way to silence your critics is do what the builder of the Panama Canal did. He had it to endure carping criticisms from countless bylookers and busybodies back home who predicted he would never complete this great task of building the Panama Canal. But he ste stepped forward tossed his hat over the, over, over, the, over the wall and kept going forward in his work. One of his subordinates has said, irritated by the flack they were receiving, so he said to, his, to, to this great engineer if he was going to say anything to his critics. And he said, in time, when the canal is finished. And maybe that's the best way to answer our critics, when we're done with the work that we're trying to do to show them the results. There comes a time in each of our lives when we have to throw our hats over the wall. In spite of everything critics might have to say. See, nothing's ever accomplished by people who just value comfort and safety and acceptance above all else. There comes a time for all of us when we have to take a leap of faith out of our comfort zone, out of what we've always known to be true. In that greatest adventure that lies between, before all of us is one of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, it's unfortunate that for the most part, that statement will fall on deaf ears. All too often we confuse discipleship with membership in a church. Or we confuse discipleship with respectability. But there's no particular risk involved in being a respectable member of a church. To become a disciple of Jesus Christ, to move from a nominal belief in a to a radical conversion, to move from a, a nodding acquaintance with God to a complete commitment of one's life. That can be more challenging than digging a canal even, or, or finding a cure for polio, or even being the best basketball player in the world. I was reading about Noel Paul Stuckey and his conversion to Jesus Christ. Some of you might know him by the beautiful wedding song that he wrote. He's now to come among you at the calling of your hearts. Rest assured this troubadour is acting on his part. The union of your spirits here has caused him to remain. For whenever two or more of you are gathered in his name, there is love. What do you know that one? Have you heard it? I'd sing it, but then you wouldn't recognize it, so I'll leave it at that. Now, others of you might know Paul Stuckey as who? 
Peter, Paul, and Mary. He's the Paul part. <laughs> At one point in his life, Stuckey was going through a time of searching and crisis, and he was disturbed by the hypocrisy in life, especially his own, and he turned to an old Greenwich Village friend named Bob Dylan for advice. <laughs> Interesting place to go. <laughs> Two things that Dylan said to him stuck out in Stuckey's mind. One was to go for a long walk in the country. And then two was to read his Bible. Paul took the advice. He walked in the country and it, and it actually helped him sort out his priorities. And he read the Bible for the very first time. It says, as he read through the entire New Testament, and even parts of the Old, there were parts that he had a hard time with, that it was slow and often mysterious. <laughs> Tell me about it, right? But something real happened in Paul Stuckey's life then, and today, he is living as a disciple of Jesus Christ. His hat was over the wall, and he followed <coughs> Isn't it time for us to also toss our hats over the wall? Certain high jumper was referring to a world record he set in his sport. He said first he had to throw his heart over the bar, and then the rest of him followed. Maybe that's what we need to do. We need to throw our hearts over the altar so the rest of us may follow. It's exciting to read about the early days of Jesus' ministry. He had his critics, of course, but he never let them detract him from his call. His, his life is a challenge to our lives. And that challenge is to become his disciple. And we only do that when we're willing to take our hat and throw it over the wall. Amen.